Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, what we're having tonight is a safety briefing by Tom, and I asked Tom to provide some information about himself. Uh, and he sat down and wrote the longest CV I've ever seen. I could read it, but it would take uh, take quite a while. The highlights are <laughs> he started uh, really his career in assisting other people, shall we say, in eighth grade as the air raid warden. And in 1975, he became licensed. He worked as a uh, electrician and remote site communication technician for a number of years and has worked for several fire departments for a total of 44 years in the fire and medical rescue service. Uh, Tom has been our electrician safety engineer for field day uh, since I forgot when, according to this. Every day since license as an amateur extra. Uh, so, 2007. So, so we're uh, we're grateful to have Tom. Tom also, as you know, has provided a list of equipment he has on loan for for field day, and that's been sent out to everybody. And so, without further ado, take it away, Tom. Thank you, sir. Okay, so um, this is going to be in the form of just a briefing. I didn't do a death by PowerPoint kind of thing um, because I don't like them much and uh, not terribly skilled at putting them together. So I'm just going to go over some points and then encourage everybody to ask all the questions they want because it's inevitable that I'll miss something. I see the safety issues of field day is having three main components. There's physical hazards, there's electronic and electrical hazards, like radio waves and excessive exposure. And then there's food hazards. Um, and I'm actually going to mention that. And it has nothing to do with the source of the food or who brought it. It has to do with how people behave when they're handling it and whether they're careful about how they do that and how they're willing to treat each other. So first, the physical hazards. Most of those arise during setup and teardown, but not exclusively. Uh, there's slip, trip, and fall. You're struck by objects. And there's um, uh, treating your body badly, sprains, strains, that sort of thing. Uh, to avoid all that, you need to comply with our standard uh, precautions, which are you'll have a hard hat if you're participating in the antenna uh, process, raising or lowering or otherwise working with antennas, you'll have a hard hat on. We've got some spares in the trailer, but not a lot. Uh, each of you is responsible for bringing head protection. When I say a hard hat, I don't mean like the ones the steel workers use. You don't have to get that quite that far into it. But I do mean a full hard hat. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're smart, you use the full brim design because they do a better job of keeping you from sunburn. And if it's raining, they'll keep the rain from rolling down your neck. Um, in addition to that, you'll use complete footwear, uh, not sandals, no flip flops, no, uh, uh, I forget what they're called, but they're the shoes you wade in creeks and lakes and stuff with that are meant for getting good and wet. They're not adequate. They don't stay on your feet when you most need them to. Uh, and so I, I'd ask that you, uh, have a full uh, set of shoes on. You'll need gloves and you should believe for yourself that the gloves could withstand an attempt by a stray piece of wire rope to penetrate the glove. Wire rope has this tendency for a strand of the rope to break sometimes because of handling or striking something. And then it's waiting for your hand to pass over it and that sliver will go right through your skin and deep into your hand Unless, of course, you're wearing a glove that you've got pretty good confidence won't accept the puncture. It's up to you. You know, nobody's going to go around and test your gloves for you. Uh, we expect you to use intelligent judgment. Um, then the uh, other thing about physical hazards is, of course, excessive radiation exposure. Um, 
if you're responsible for putting up a tenor and antenna, you have to use one of the online calculators, unless you're a glutton for punishment, in which case you might actually borrow the right measuring equipment and get really scientific. But the FCC has said the online calculators are acceptable. And there's two areas, and we've got to pay attention to that now for field day. There's an uncontrolled area where our guests can be with complete uh, safety. And there's a controlled area where no one can be there beyond a short interval of time without risking excessive radio frequency energy exposure. And we've got to separate the two. And the absolute minimum would be barrier tape. So we'll get a roll of that and we'll put it up. And if possible, we'll get the one that says radiation hazard on it. That'll wake them up. But the second part of that is to keep your eyes and ears open. And when you see somebody you don't know wandering in the uh, controlled area, you immediately holler for everybody to stop transmitting. And somebody goes out there and gets them and escorts them out of the controlled area. If you don't do it, you're exposing the club to a tremendous amount of problems. So you got to do it and do it immediately. And let whoever gets the task of going out there and escorting them out of there to the uh, re-education. Uh, you don't all have to yell and scream at them. You know, one of us talking to them seriously but politely is enough. But don't just blithely continue transmitting when somebody's wandered out into the antenna field. It's just not an acceptable practice. The other kind of physical hazard involves the stuff that we put in place for field day. There's all sorts of wires of various kinds underfoot. And there's the guy lines right about from, you know, right about your ankle level all the way up to your head level and beyond. And especially as it gets darker and the sun goes down, it's very easy to walk into those. One great way to prevent that is nobody enters the controlled area. Because if you're not in the controlled area, you're not going to run into a guy line because they'll be in the controlled area. So if everybody follows that simple rule, if there's a single soul transmitting and you haven't arranged to have them take their co coax off all the equipment, you got no business in the controlled area. So that will take care of the guy line hazard. Um, the cables underfoot are the obvious ones, but they also will be past the boundary of the pavilion or correctly laid up around the units on the other side. So they won't be in the footpath. If you use the footpath that will be marked out for you to go to the trailer or to go to any of the other stations over there, you won't run into any of those tripping hazards. And by and large, those are the physical hazards that dominate field day struck by are the most dangerous kind. Struck by is like when a block gets loose from the uh, head of a mast or a tower and the block falls on you. Well, if it strikes your shoulder, you're going to have some pain and a big bruise, but if it struck your head and you don't have a hard head on, you could suffer a truly serious injury. That's why we harp on hard hats. Um, so hard hats, gloves, shoes, and pay attention. And if for, if for any reason, you don't feel you're alert and oriented times three, get out of the danger area. Get away from the antenna raising. If you start to get sleepy because you set up all day yesterday and you didn't get much sleep last night, get out of there. Use your head for something besides a hat rack and take care of yourself. Be responsible. The next category of things that we have to be concerned about is cooking processes and equipment. I'm not talking about the food safety issue now. And power production. Why? Because they all use energy in one form or another that can hurt you. If we have a stove going, it's expected that people won't rearrange the stove after, the, uh, after Alex or whoever she appointed to do it, uh, set it up. It's not up to me or anybody else to say, well, I wouldn't have set it up, so what? If it was good enough for Alex or whoever she appointed, it's good enough for me. You don't rearrange cooking equipment, especially not while it's operating or has hot food on it. Okay, so we're going to make some coffee undoubtedly. So that's, the, that's a guarantee we'll have one heating device in the food area. And don't mess with it except to pour. Then you can't get scalded. 
The other category that's in that same let's not get burned kind of thing is the generator and refueling the generator. Now, I don't know if we got one for the trailer yet, but I have an external gener generator fuel tank for my generator. And the beautiful thing about that is there's a safe way to disconnect it, walk it away the requisite 25 feet and refuel it nowhere near the generator, leaving the generator happily running on its internal tank until I plug the external tank back in and it switches to the external tank, never having had an open fuel container anywhere near the operating generator. If you must fuel a generator directly, you have to shut it off and wait until it cools. So it's a good idea to make an alternate plan because you may not have yourself in a situation where everybody can do it without the generator, especially if all the stations in the pavilion are running off the one. So use Use your head, uh, be prepared for that, have your batteries ready and things like that. Be prepared to run for a little while while they shut it down, allow it to cool and then refuel it. Um, then the other thing there is fuel handling in general is, is dangerous. There are two kinds of flammable, there are two kinds of burnable liquids. Uh, flammable liquids are those that at normal temperatures and pressures will burn without much provocation. Any good spark will ignite them. Uh, combustible liquids are the ones that have to get over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or they have to be absorbed into a wick, or they have to be pumped through a fine orifice that'll turn them into very small particles, which the industry calls atomization, even though it's got nothing to do with particle physics. Uh, so absent that, it's a lot harder to get combustible liquids to burn. Unfortunately, I have never seen us bring a diesel generator to field day. We always use the flammable liquid gasoline. So when somebody's about to handle that, they need a partner. And please don't be grudging about being that partner because you need to clear the fire extinguisher and get ready to activate it and use it while they're pouring gasoline. If anything were to go wrong, you're going to be the one that's going to save them from a serious injury by extinguishing the fire just about instantly and then applying water to any burns and keep applying it until uh, appropriate medical help has taken over. Any questions about the gasoline, refueling generators, anything you're indicted, in doubt about, I'd invite you to make them now so that we don't get way down the road and something else and get back here. Anybody got a question about fueling and safety with fueling. I'll take that as a note. Um, the uh, next thing is food safety. Um, Alex does a lot of work to get us good food on the site and feed us. So what we have to do is use the hand washing facilities that are available to us and clean our hands really well and don't touch anybody's food but your own with your bare hands. There are implements there, Alex has provided them every year for you to dish yourself up food. So use them, don't be rude. And also don't be holding involved conversations right at the food station because some of us are better at this than others, but everybody when they're speaking does a little bit of invisible spitting. Not comfortable to think about, but you do. So hold your gob until you step away from the food. We don't have the equipment to put in there with a nice little shield like in a, a, a smorgasbord restaurant. Uh, it takes a little thought and courtesy so that nobody will transmit an intestinally uh, hosted virus from themselves unknowingly to some portion of the rest of the group. So those, those are the physical hazards. Now let's get into some of the, what I call concealed energy hazards. The concealed energy hazards are predominantly from electricity and radio frequency energy. You don't want to make the intimate acquaintance of either one. So the basic uh, rules there is to use the equipment in your checklist that we've provided and we'll provide it again this year. We've, you'll see one in a few moments. We've 
fixed it up to where uh, it's really readable. So I'll display it for you and point out some things on it. Um, and as long as you follow these guidelines, you've got a pretty low probability of, of getting hurt with electricity. This year, we will be supplying, or rather I will be supplying, um, distribution boxes that are protected with ground fault circuit interrupters. So if you were to do something wrong and, and suffer an electrical shock, I can't say it won't hurt, but I can say it won't harm. You still may hate life for a few seconds, but it's not gonna kill you. Um, you may hear the, the uh, pop of the GFCI opening at the same time you're uttering some expletive, but that's okay. You're still upright to utter the expletive. You're doing good. And uh, the other thing we're asking everybody to do as part of protecting their equipment is to use a good quality surge protector. And if you can bring yourself to spend the money, use one that's also a power conditioner. Most surge protectors are not. But for instance, the Trip Light brand and several others are power conditioners. They'll keep a lot of racket out of your radio gear by conditioning the power to remove any of the spikes and spurious energy and hums and so forth from the gear at your protector. Um, so it does two things for you. It makes sure that a grounded return path for any stray current is always present. In the absence of that, the new ground fault circuit interrupters will open before you're shocked. If they lose their ground path, they open. Uh, they're not gonna put up with that situation. They've been upgraded in design and all the ones built in say the last 10 years, you can't turn them on or turn them back on once they trip unless there's a solid ground present. Now, as for the RF energy, we just went over some of that. Uh, and to point out how serious it, this is, the four MIT students who were part of the MIT radio club who invented voice radio, invented it out of whole cloth, took a regular radio and they ran the radio frequency energy through the handset of a telephone and used the carbon mic to modulate it. It went swimmingly. There were a lot of positive comments. They made the front page of the Boston Globe. MIT being in Boston. And they also spent weeks in the hospital with a condition called radio frequency fever because they let too much raw RF onto their bodies during their three hour experiment and were very ill. They did all recover without permanent effect, but another hour or two and who knows. Now, yeah, the apparatus was crude and they didn't fully understand what they were messing with, but there are, hazards together with radio today that are easy to forget or let slip past you. Uh, and this is once again, why no one of us should put up with seeing somebody out in the controlled area of the antennas. Anybody, nobody should be out there while the radios are working because they might make the intimate acquaintance of a nasty fella called RF Burns. If you've ever had a radio frequency burn, you know they're an internal burn, not a surface burn. They don't leave mark on the surface. They don't create blisters. Instead, they cook a small portion of the tissue inside your skin. And it's very unpleasant and it takes weeks to heal uh, because it's not at the normal level where your body knows how to deal with it. Uh, so in order to prevent contact, you have to use the procedures you already know but you have to pay close attention to anybody who enters that controlled area. And if it's not really obvious why, uh, because they told you in advance and they're gonna work on this antenna that's way over here and is not being used right now. If you don't know why, bring it to the attention of the safety monitor who's on duty at that time and we'll get them out of there. And yes, you all have to stop transmitting until it's done. Um, because otherwise, we're the ones that know radio. We're the ones that are expected to know enough to keep people from getting hurt. And we know they don't belong in a controlled area. And if we keep transmitting, we're sticking our neck out the window and hollering curses after running a hell of a sale on machetes. 
somebody's going to lop us off right at the neck. And you can bet they'll have a degree in law. So don't take the chances of that happening. Don't let anybody wander around out there. Um, now, the next thing that I want to urge everybody to be aware of is the things that happen both before and after field day. If you're one of the people who likes to go the whole 24 or even some major part of it, and then you help us pick up and you head home, you really should make an evaluation of your ability to drive. You also should not even think about doing any of the extraordinary things that some people have done at field day in the last four years. Every single field day has produced a death by a fall off a tower. Now, you know it's field day. You can't use pre-built equipment, right? It's forbidden. It's against the rules. What does that tell you about the kind of tower they were climbing? It was a temporary tower. Please, unless you are suicidal and I can't help you there, don't climb any of the temporary antenna supports, no matter what form they take. Uh, and don't rest a ladder against them. That's no better. Because if the support decides to take a vacation on you, your ladder and you are going to go with it. So don't use an antenna support as a support for anything but an antenna. Now, you can't help it if a squirrel or something climbs up there. All you can do is stop transmitting and we'll shake the thing until it decides to rattle down the guy lines. But for yourself, you've got no business even partially up any of the antenna supports we're likely to use. So just don't do it. Uh, dying at field day is not my idea of a, a fun way to go. Field day is supposed to be a great experience. And talk about a way to make everybody miserable and your family just heartbroken to the max. That would be it. So be responsible. Now, really, this all does boil down to those two words. Be responsible. Don't expect others to bail you out of not thinking about something. Be the one that thinks about it your own self. And one last thing about that. Being responsible also means not quarreling or belittling or ridiculing the safety people. We may ask you to not do something or to do something, and it may not be the first thing on your mind right then, and you may not like it. Consider first that only reason we do this, that we volunteer to do this and, and go through all this work is because we like y'all and we don't want you to get hurt. And we're willing to do some extra work for you to try and keep you from getting hurt. So if you're willing to just grin and bear it, and unless you've got a good reason that you're prepared to articulate seriously and quietly, just follow the instruction. Nobody's going to swear and curse at you because by and large, we're not that type of people. But we would appreciate the cooperation if we say, don't do that. Usually we have a good reason. Okay. And in regards to the fire extinguishers that we will have on the site, you've got to look at them. And if you have any questions about how to use them, you get in hold of a, a safety monitor. There'll be three people helping me that have each, their essential job is to be on the site with CPR skills because that's part of our safety points. We have to have a person on the site during all operating periods that's CPR qualified. Um, so those three other people and I, um, if we ask you to do something, please do it, uh, especially if we need help. And if you don't understand an extinguisher, get help understanding it. Uh, one of the things we might use that many of you have never seen before is a cartridge operated extinguisher. And the reason we use it is because they can be refilled without a, a uh, extinguisher service company. They can be refilled by the user quite safely, which saves us money that we don't have to charge the club and the field day budget and all of that. Even if it's discharged, the cost of refilling is truly minor. Uh, but that means you have to pay attention to how you use it. It is different from the vast majority of extinguishers. The other thing is we're going to have one or perhaps two what are called backpack pump extinguishers 
uh, locally referred to by the dominant brand name of Indian pumps. I don't use it except to mention that's what they're branded. I don't think it's a uh, socially correct way to describe anything. Uh, so I call them what the Forest Service calls them, a backpack pump. Um, they're soft and hard versions. What I'll bring is probably gonna be two soft ones. But those have an additional use beyond putting out a trash can fire or something like that, where running for the extinguisher out by the fuel is not warranted. And that is if somebody goes down from heat injury, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, you should empty the bag while the fire department's responding by spraying a fine spray on that person head to foot and keep it up. If you need to get into the second five gallons, you do that. And if you've got some left over from the second five gallons, you send it with the patient in the ambulance and they will spray them down with cool water all the way to the emergency department. Uh, that will actually save lives. So it's a two purpose thing. That's why we have it there. Um, we don't have any foam solution to use and the cost is too high uh, for me to bear the cost. So we won't have foam in them. They're only suitable for use on solids that will burn, not on liquids. Um, and although we don't usually have this sort of food at field day, um, if somebody gets adventurous, some spouse or something, and they, they've brought in uh, a fry pan and are doing deep fat frying, you need to know that the worst thing you can do if that fat catches fire is to apply a dry chemical extinguisher to it because it will cause the stuff to react, boil over and spread the fire all over the place. So if that's to happen, the only proper thing to do is to carefully take a pair of tongs or whatever and drop the cover over the pan or anything else that won't burn that will smother the fire because we won't have, because they're so expensive and you can't rent them, the wet chemical fire extinguisher present that will deal with deep fat. And if you realize somebody's setting up to do something like that, you know, they've got out a fry pan, they're putting a stove out, get a hold of the safety monitor immediately and we'll explain to them why we don't want them doing that. But once it's happening, it's a little bit too late. And you certainly don't want to startle somebody who's cooking with deep fat, so take it easy. But if they are, and they make a mistake and the fat gets too hot and it burns, don't try and apply ABC dry chemical to it. It will not go well. All right, last things about safety is the safety of your equipment. Now, first I have to acquaint you with a fire service algorithm that has become gospel uh, in the last 20 years. It was devised by a, a now deceased but very loved fire chief from Phoenix called Alan Bunicini. And Alan's mantra was risk a lot to save a lot, risk a little to save a little risk nothing to save nothing. And what he meant by that and drilled into his people and eventually most of the nation's firefighters is you risk a lot to save a human life. You risk a little and only in a calculated way to save property. You risk nothing to save a life already lost or property already destroyed. So imagine that we've had the worst happen, the lightning struck and we got fire coming out of a piece of equipment. That equipment can't be saved. It's done for. It's destroyed. It's going to be replaced. So running out there in a lightning storm and trying to apply an extinguisher to it is not a good move. You're risking trading your life for a piece of property. Don't even consider it. It's unfortunate, but it's gone. Think clearly, then act decisively. So in protecting the equipment, if you follow the diagram I'm about to go over with you, your equipment and most importantly, you will be protected from lightning. But first I gotta go over lightning a little bit with you. Years ago, about uh, seven now, there were a couple of teenage brothers sitting on the beach in Barrow Beach, Florida. The sky above them was really blue, as blue as David's background photograph is. I mean, it looked like that. It was perfectly clear. And yet those boys were killed by lightning. The cloud mass inland that they ignored 
was five miles away from them. But the Weather Service has records of people being struck at nearly twice that distance. If you can hear thunder, and everybody on the beach that was interviewed agreed that there was thunder, although it wasn't sharp, it was in the distance, you were close enough to be struck. You do not have to be under the cloud that generates the return stroke. Lightning consists of a, an upward stroke that you can't see, which is establishing the ionized path, and then the return stroke, which you can see and is extremely dangerous because of the amount of amps in it, and the heat it produces. Thunder is in fact a sonic boom. When lightning discharges, it heats the air so high that the noise created is faster than the speed of sound. And that's why thunder sounds so sharp and so overall disturbing is because it's really a sonic boom generated in the air by the heat of the lightning. That's not a force you wanna play with. So be aware that Lightning doesn't have to be on top of you, and you don't have to wait until the lightning is just over the ridge. We're still, no. Yeah, I know it's field day. I know it's fun. I know you want to run up a great score. And as soon as we hear lightning, we're going to ask everybody to go in the activity center and wait it out. And a great tool for that, so that you don't have to always be watching around the horizon, is an ordinary battery entertainment radio, and you tune it to anywhere on the AM band where there is no signal and turn the volume down a little. Because what you're gonna hear if lightning's approaching is you're gonna hear the static crashes on the radio long before you'll hear audible thunder. And that'll tell you you've gotta start looking out and listening. And when you do hear audible thunder, we all get the heck out of Dodge and go in the activity center. So those two teenage kids with not a worry in the world died out there at Vero Beach, five miles away from the storm that killed them. Take that as an instructive lesson and don't take any lightning event lightly. The safe places include fully enclosed buildings and fully enclosed hard top cars with the windows rolled up, even if you're sweating your ears off. Fire lookouts learned long ago that if you leave the windows open, even though it's stifling to close them, that the breeze can put ionized air into the cab of the tower or into the interior of the car that will carry a lightning right to you. We've had a couple of deaths right here in Montgomery County from that very thing. Under what? Picnic pavilions. Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, just like the one we're gonna use for field day. So they thought they were safe. They were under the pavilion and a breeze threw the ionized air across them and the discharge killed them. Don't take that chance with your own life. When the thunder roars, we all go indoors and nobody beefs about it and nobody belittles it. Uh, we just do it. Now, we'll do a brief talk, you know, just before field day starts, just before the operating period starts, sometime around one o'clock, to show you the extinguisher and to pantomime using it. Uh, and we'll have a label on it with pictographic instructions. Uh, but if you pay attention the first time and think about it, you'll be able to use it very easily if, the, if the, your turn comes to need to lay your hands on it and discharge it. And anytime anybody's refueling, be willing to be their partner to cover them so that they can't get badly burned or worse. Uh, that contact can wait. Uh, and there's another contact coming along behind it. So as my mother, God rest her soul, he used to say to my sisters, honey, never run for a streetcar or a man. There'll be another one along in a minute. And that's the way I feel about a contact during a contest. It's never worth somebody's safety. There'll be another contact along, or you might find that one again later. Meanwhile, you've protected one of your fellow club members from the possibility are no fun at all. If you've ever heard a burned patient being debrided, they scream like wounded animals. So you don't want that to happen to you. All right, does anybody have any questions out of all that? And, you know, the only question that I would ever classify as stupid is when you chicken out on asking. If you want to know, you ask. And anybody who thinks that's a bad idea, they're the one that's being stupid. 
not you. So anything you want to know about these topics, please ask. And if you're too reluctant to ask during a meeting, I'm open to being asked anytime by any media you choose to use. You can call me on the phone if you need to know something. Emails are fine. Uh, my call sign at ARRL.net does forward to me nicely. Um, so you have it. And that call sign, since I realized I didn't put it on the display like I should have, is W3TDH, Whiskey 3 Tango Delta Hotel. OK, I think that puts us through the briefing without any agonizing or extra details. But I want to share one fact with you that's important. Uh, Al Taylor. KN3U is doing a presentation on the radio amateur training and uh, organizing net that is nationwide and is organized by the emergency coordinators for all the sections all across the country. And it's on Zoom. I'm going to forward out right now on the reflector a copy of the access codes that starts at nine o'clock. There'll be a little bit of before business, but not much. And they get right into it after about 9.05. So please take the time and go see Al's presentation because it's an, a basic explanation of the Mid-Atlantic Internet Protocol Network. And that's a very important emergency system that we're trying to build out. And you'll undoubtedly learn a lot because I don't think there's many people who can beat Al on technical topics. Very much worth seeing. Back to the meeting. Over to you, Alex. Uh, did you want to show the checklist? Tom? Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to show the diagram. You're right. The let diagram. Me, let me bring that up. While you're bringing that up, Tom, I did have a question. You mentioned multiple times there are safety monitors at field day. How can uh, any of our other operators identify who the safety monitors are? Will they be wearing anything that makes it so they're, it's clear to tell who they are? They will either be wearing a hard hat with a marker on it that says uh, safety monitor um, or safety, just a rocker that says safety, or they will be wearing a hard hat that is green with or without a rocker. And failing that, they'll just have a green cloth or a green marking tape tied around their upper arm. Um, maybe it's a person who's not comfortable wearing a hat, but you'll be able to see them. And if you yourself are a person who is qualified in CPR, please volunteer to take a portion of the operational period for me. I'm certainly not going to be there and awake for 24 hours. I can guarantee you that. Uh, I figure now that I'm past 70, uh, I get away with saying, nope, not up for that. Uh, or as the comedian kept saying, when you're 70, who cares? So bear with me and help out as much as you can and, and take this seriously and don't give safety volunteers a hard time. And that's what I have for you. Back to you. Uh, wait, this diagram. Let me get that open. Hang on. Where'd you go? Oh, there you go. Okay, so now I'll hit share screen and if somebody's allowed me to, it'll go to my screen. I'm going to use my mouse as a pointer. Can everybody see it? Yes. OK, the, the dashed line is the protected area of your operating position. The idea is that nothing can get into or out of that area to harm somebody without passing that dashed line. And we're going to protect every conductive path that enters your operating area. 
in two different ways. We're going to provide pretty effective protection in the form of ground fault circuit interrupters that will be mounted in metal boxes behind metal plates. And the reason that's important is that no matter what type they are, they won't be likely to be affected by radio frequency energy and false trip. Um, uh, you want a fun story. Have our boss to tell you what happened when he stepped out on his back porch with a two meter walkie talkie just after they opened the new development behind him. He keyed the mic and all the homes back there went dark because back then the ground fault circuit interrupters had very poor radio immunity. His five watt circuit knocked all the house's power out. But Al tells it a lot better than I do, so get him to share it with you. Okay, so how we protect this area is with two major things, both of which have to be provided uh, by arrangement of the person that's setting up the operating position. The operating position bonding bus is supplied by Mark, but you have to get it on your operating position and you have to hook it up. Nobody's gonna come around and, and frankly babysit you. We'll provide it, it'll be there, but you've got to hook it up. Um, we've said over and over again, the best thing you can hook it up to is a piece of copper ribbon. You can get copper flashing at any good supply house and the ribbons don't need to be long enough that you need a special source. One inch wide is fine and flat ribbon does a lot better job than any conductor you can put there. You use the braid stuff only for connecting things that need to be moved almost constantly and manipulated as to their location. The braid is not as effective as a flat copper ribbon. And if you have nothing else, you use a bare copper wire of at least number 10 gauge, better still number six, but number 10 is uh, within the standard, not as effective, but it's within the standard. And all of them get connected to this one station operating position bonding bus. And that arrangement's job is to bond all your equipment to each other, all right? So that all of them will remain at the same potential. That doesn't mean they won't elevate in voltage on the case in the event of an untoward event. It just means that since they're all singing to the same sheet of music, the high note won't hurt anybody. Uh, to get electrons flowing destructively, you need a difference of potential. So you don't ne really need to care if everything went to a thousand volts on the case, as long as it did it pretty close in time to all the stuff around it. It's not going to force destructive currents between the units. So that's why you bond it all to this one place. Do not, please do not daisy chain from say your transceiver to your power supply or anything similar. Uh, since they've changed the rules and the amplified signals are not allowed this year, um, we won't have anybody using amplifiers, I don't think, but all the equipment that gets bonded gets bonded to the one spot. That way you can be sure it goes up and down and that a uh, flow that is going to go through the bonding conductors will not go right through another piece of equipment first. That, that's almost a, a prescription for destroying equipment. And if you're the operator with his hand on the mic at that moment, it's a prescription for harming you. So bond them all to the same place. This diagram is instructive. It's not representational. The bonding bar we provide is no more than a foot long, and it's to make sure that they're all really physically close to each other. One more thing, your transceiver, even at a minimum, is going to have cost you $700 or more when you put in all the things together, uh, because there's only one station out there that's going to be using the less expensive VHF, UHF equipment. Uh, and if you add in the, the welcome desk and talk in too, but the rest are all gonna be HF and there aren't that many HF radios uh, except QRP rigs and small kits that cost less than $600. So $600 against $60 for this gimmick right here, it's called an electromagnetic pulse coaxial protector. It is far more sensitive than a coaxial 
protector that is meant for just surges, spikes, and lightning discharges, because those fire at a much higher temperature uh, and allow the voltage to rise a lot higher. Having one of these, it's optional. Nobody's going to come along and, and scold you or look at you cross-eyed. But having one of these located at the bonding bus to protect your radio is a very good thing and will cost you less than a tenth of the cost of replacing the radio. And the nicer the radio you have, the percentage of the cost of the radio keeps going down. It's not going to go up for a nicer radio. Uh, there are several manufacturers that make them, among them uh, um, Polytech and uh, Polyphaser also makes them. Uh, I forget the names of some of the others, but they are not a common lightning protector. And you can find them if you look for them. Um, and they're a little pricey, but nowhere near the cost of your radio. Uh, it is optional. Nobody's going to tisk you but it's something you might want to consider. Um, this protector out at the main grounding point, those are provided by the club. We have an entry panel that we carry on a trailer that has enough protectors for all the antennas we could possibly want to engage out of the pavilion side. And similarly situated will be the trailer. Now, anybody who's planning to set up an individual station of some kind uh, all on its own, on that side of the road where the trailer is going to be is responsible for setting up their own grounding. We'll coach, we'll loan equipment, but don't expect us to come over and set it up for you. Not our job, not our circus, not our monkeys. So we're just not likely to do that for you unless you have a good reason uh, like a physical disability and you can just call Paul in advance and ask for his help and Paul will have no hesitation turning to me or any of the other people who are still blessed with functioning everything uh, and will help if you need it that way. But not because you're not feeling like doing it. If you're not feeling like doing it, a decision not to prepare is a decision to do without and therefore to risk damage and even injury and perhaps even death. Uh, so if you're setting up a single by yourself station, you've got to take responsibility for all of this. We'll advise, we'll loan equipment. Uh, and if you're unable to set it up yourself, you can ask for help, but you've got to take responsibility for it. Now this box down here that my uh, cursor is running over right now, this is the other protector between you and the generator. This will have a class one surge protector in it. And the only reason it's got such a robust protector is in case reflected power from a lightning discharge or some similar event were to induce a current into the electric cord. Certainly the generators we're, we're using won't produce enough of a power to make a light show. However, it only takes 30 hundredths of an amp to kill you deader than dead. I mean, not just clinically dead, I mean, biologically dead. Your brain is no longer with us and your personality has left this earth. So these are where our ground fault circuit interrupters are going to be. These on both sides of the road is where the surge protectors are gonna be. And the only thing left for yours to do is provide secondary surge protection and power conditioning, but you must have one that'll do it. And that means you must buy one and prepare it by installing an external stud on it. You have to put a, a screw of the appropriate metal through the case from the inside to the outside, lock it down with lock washers uh, and a split washer on the outside with a nut and a jam nut. Jam nuts are thinner than regular nuts and they're put down on a nut to keep the nut from backing off the threads. Uh, and then over that, you put a pair of appropriate material washers and a wing nut, because that's the place you can put your grounding conductor, your bonding conductor between uh, this device. And you can barely see it here where my pointer is now, between your protector and the common bonding bus. 
And so that anybody uh, who's thinking you never do that, uh, it may have been true at one time, but it's been approved by the National Electric Code for 15 years now. It's called an auxiliary grounding connection. And the only place you can't do it is on a wire that's actually conducting electricity. You can do it on any equipment grounding conductor, which are all really equipment bonding conductors, but let's not get hung up on words. Um, then notice that this same distribution box has other leads coming off it to other stations. That's why it's bonded to the common ground. And that's why each of these leads will go to one power protector on the operating station. Nobody's gonna split it out or put a three-way or anything on it. It goes into one surge protector that you provided for your operating position. And that's where it goes. So your surge protector has gotta be large enough and arranged properly for everything you wanna plug in with. And that provides the commonality between that and the coax and that and any other wire that enters your station to keep them at near the same potential so that there isn't, oh, the power goes in this way, crosses through the power leads and comes out on the coax or vice versa. I guess vice versa is more likely. You don't want that happening. The difference between those wires would be really bad with them both attached to the same bonding bus. The difference is also going to be small and unlikely altogether. That's the reason for this. And a reason for the optional protector is if there's uh, a surge on the power wiring due to reflected energy from a lightning strike, even this short bit of coax here between the protecting board and your station and your radio can pick up some of that energy. And an EMP protector, uh, either at the bonding bus bar itself or at the entry connection to the transceiver, either one will fire before the main protector out here fires. And it'll cause more current to flow, which will cause that one to fire because the voltage drop will create a voltage across it. And it's much faster acting than a regular lightning protector. I don't think the Russians are gonna attack us with an overhead device during field days. So I'm not really worried about EMP, but I am worried about uh, having something that will fire a little earlier than the regular surge protector will be. Um, this is the grounding array you've seen every year. It goes in the field just beyond the pavilion. This is the panel that serves as a single point grounding bus bar. It's got all the arresters on it. Um, and if you're gonna take any other kind of line out of your station, you either tell us in advance and we'll tell you we can handle it or you're going to provide a protector for it, or we're gonna ask you not to use it. So if you bring a remote antenna coupler and a remote antenna coupler line, but you don't bring an antenna control line surge protector, we're going to ask you not to use it. Same thing goes with a rotor line. You bring the rotor line, you didn't tell us in advance, you didn't give us a chance to arrange to borrow a protector, bring it properly mounted and connected. We're gonna ask you to do without the rotor. And you'll have to use the Armstrong method of rotating the mast with a strap wrench like you remove an oil can with. And that's gonna mean that it has to be located so you're not gonna be in a hot RF zone. So you just add a lot of complications. Don't do it to us. Let Paul know in advance, he's got a bunch of people who are really good about this stuff uh, that will advise and cooperate and work with him uh, in taking care of anything he actually knows about. If you keep it a secret, we're not gonna know and we can't help you with it. So remember, any conductor of any form that crosses that dashed line needs protection. And if it's not a common one that we already have on this entry bulkhead, you need to warn us and provide one, or at least get some help to borrow to provide one. We need to have a protector on a control line of any kind. Any questions about that last? Yeah, I, I have a question, uh, more like a request. Can you give us 
via email or through the chat. Um, we're gonna buy the that sixty dollar device. It is cheaper than a fifteen hundred dollar uh, Kenwood radio. <laughs> yes, so sir. I would appreciate um, it. So, yeah, um, this is going to be posted. Uh, it's going to be sent out as an email on the Mark Reflector. So don't trash it before you even looked at it because it will be this diagram will be an attachment, and I'll all send you. I'll also send you what I can find for uh, vendors who are vending EMP protectors for coax, and right. the prices are all over the place, folks. So shop carefully. Some of them are meant for military uh, units working in a hostile environment, and you don't want to pay the money for those. So, you know, you you buy the ordinary kind that are meant for basically a commercial base station at an oil uh, dispatching shop rather than the ones that the military would use in theater on the nuclear frontier with Russia. So use your head and don't spend your whole budget on one device. Right. Uh, did everybody see my chat? I mean, uh, Tom did a fantastic presentation on um happened to be module 18 of the uh, AWRL technician class um and there's a link to the vimeo and i'm going to send out an email to this and alex i'll propose that maybe you take the video and put it on your youtube channel so we have to figure out the logistics how to do that <laughs> that's just an idea uh, but you're the man what can i say now, practical question. So let's say some people set up across the road. Do you have tools to sink uh, ground rods and then to bring them out of the ground? And I think the answer is yes. Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, the question is the quantities of them. Now, if from memory, the club has uh, nine ground rod segments, three feet long, and that's more than enough to build an array. Uh, and between myself and Hank and the club itself, we're somewhere near seven uh, surface wire grounding kits, which can be used in lieu of those ground rods. The Army's done the research right up here at Aberdeen in Maryland, and they are as effective, so they can be used as a reasonable substitute. You just have to be careful of how you connect them to uh, other things because they are galvanized steel. And so you've got to use connectors that are compatible with both steel and copper. Any other questions on that? Okay, so I'll send that out as an attachment. How to take, oh, I got to ask, who knows how attachments fa fare on the uh, reflector? Do they, are they still there? Or do they end up someplace else? Yeah, I could answer that. Today I sent out a half a meg photo of our test venue the outdoor test session anybody have trouble seeing it because i didn't get a bounce saying yeah it's too big or anything like that no, Alex? came through fine okay so uh i'm sure your pdf file of your of this diagram is less than 500k okay so i'll send that out as an attachment and hopefully and if any of you who are here tonight notice that it's been stripped by some process well, send an email back to me right away and say the software stripped it because that happens with some reflectors. Uh, they won't let the attachments go through as a way of combating malware. Um, so look for it. And if it doesn't show up at all, you, you get the email, but it doesn't have the attachment. Please get back to me quickly so I can do something to remedy that. Um, a lot of this information is going to be reposted fairly soon to the mcacs.net website. Uh, so you can uh, the uh, you, you can make arrangements to just view the website. It'll be in the unsecured uh, portion of the website. You just check on and look under uh, tips and there'll be a link there to the diagrams and the other things we're gonna put up, including a pictograph of how to operate a cartridge operated fire extinguisher. Any more questions? Okay, you've all got 17 minutes to make it over to Al's presentation or do and do whatever Alex still has in store for us. Back to the meeting.
Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, I think we all appreciate your volunteering to be safety. And I can't imagine a more experienced and expert person to do that. Uh, just real quick, right now we're still looking for operators to bring equipment. Right now we have three people signed up. One of them will be on the south side. Uh, we're looking for people to operate out of the Mark trailer. And at next, at the next meeting, we're going to have a presentation by Dennis, KD6 DPR, who is going to do the logging and the networking. And anybody have any questions about any aspect of field day? Go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Um, the uh, issue of equipment, if you want to set up a station, but you're not a person who has uh, the right equipment, there is a lot of equipment in this club, including my own, that could be loaned. I'm not in planning to set up a station because I'm involved in so much other stuff, but I'd happily loan all the equipment you'd need to set up an HF station, as long as you're willing to take responsibility for returning the equipment to me in as good a condition as you got it. So you want to borrow equipment? Send me an email, call me on the phone, whatever you need to do. Thank you. Hey, Ron. Okay, uh, quick question. Are we planning on setting up on Friday? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Alex, what time is uh, breakfast going to be ready on Friday? <laughs> For you, Ron, anything you like. <laughs> well, probably, you know, depending on the time for breakfast, we always have like uh, bagels and things like that. So we'll be fine. No one's going to go hungry. Great question. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Thank you. And there's a fair number of fairly good breakfast places right there in Damascus. Yeah. They're not far away. Nope. Okay. Anybody have any? Uh non-food related questions about field day. Okay, so again, the next meeting we'll have on uh, logging and networking. And thank you all for attending this meeting. And that's it for the presentation. Back to you, Alex.